Good morning. Welcome. It is Sunday and it is August 20th, 2023. Our topic today is loving your perfectly imperfect self and others, I might add. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to begin with an opening prayer. So let's come together. Let's come together in knowing and recognizing that there is one source, one life, one God, one mind, which our minds are connected. We are one with that one mind, that one power. And we know that while all that power is available to us, all that love is available to us, we know we are not all of it. We are part of it. And we remember the sayings of Jesus, which he said were the two important laws. There were only two laws, he said. And that is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy might. And the second is equal unto it, which is love thy neighbor as thyself. There is so much wisdom packed in those two laws. We know that we have no trouble loving the Lord our God. We sometimes have trouble loving ourselves or our neighbors. And so today we consider that, we consider the wisdom of it, how we may improve on that so that we may have life more abundantly. We give thanks we release and together we say, and, and so, so it is. is. Beautiful. So it would seem to be easy, wouldn't it? We, we, you know, it's easy to love God, whom we consider the ideal, the ideal lover, the ideal giver, the all, all powerful uh, entity in, in our experience. And yet for ourselves, you know, we know we're not perfect and we know others are not perfect. And so oftentimes we will withhold uh, our love and sometimes our approval of ourselves or others. And that's where we get into tricky business. And so we want to explore that. Bob's going to focus on loving yourself. I'm going to take it more into how we can better love others. Uh, so... I think I'll start with a little quote about loving ourselves, though. Sure. Okay. Before I forget it. Yeah. The trick in this uh, loving thyself, loving others as thyself is, is that we often don't love ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And if we don't love ourselves, really hard to love others, but then we don't trust anybody. Um, so Ernest Holmes says, we are to know that passing events cannot hinder the onward march of the soul. The temporal imperfection in temporal meaning in time, the temporal imperfection of the human cannot dim the eternal integrity of the divine. And so we want to talk a little bit more about how we can honor. Sure. I'm going to start ourselves. off with, with, a, with a couple of questions. Uh, one is, have you ever done something that you later regretted, felt bad about, and judged yourself harshly for? Probably not. Never, never. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you ever have you ever done anything that you felt bad about that even now today, when you think about it, you still feel bad about it? And I think if the answer to that is yes, then I think what we need we need to have a conversation, which is what we're going to be having today. And I'm going to start off with actually one of the who I believe was the father of cognitive therapy. It was Albert Ellis, uh, one of my heroes, and somebody I actually studied with many many years ago. And Albert Ellis said, and I love this, we always, we're always doing the best we can, always doing the best we can, given what we know and given what we believe. Now, what do we know? Well, we know based on our experience, the things that have happened, the things that are going on, we know about all of that experience that we're having, and we form beliefs out of what it is that we know. And those beliefs often uh, can get us in a lot of trouble because what we know is probably and it is flawed as it is possible to have anything be flawed. So we often know things that are not true and we believe things that aren't true, mm -hmm. but we believe them in the context of our time. And Judith and I were talking uh, uh, earlier and some of you are old enough to remember the 70s, the 60s and 70s. And there were a lot of norms in the 60s and 70s that aren't norms now. 
there were a lot of things that everybody was doing, which we can't talk about, <laughs> that was not only acceptable, but you were looked at with, you're not doing that? What's wrong with you? This is the 60s. This is the 70s. So in the context of the time, we were doing the best we could, knowing what we knew and believing what we believe, which was this is the best way to live. You know, the, the express freedom in every area you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Were there consequences for that? Of course, there were consequences for that. The problem with that is, as we evolve and, and our consciousness evolves, and we come up with a new a new knowing, and we change our beliefs, what also happens then is we judge our past experience based on that, not on the on the time that we were having these experiences. Well, that makes us pretty critical of ourselves in 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 an embarrassing kind of way. In fact, it wouldn't be uncommon for us to feel a lot of shame and to feel even some self-loathing about the life we lived when that was the life we were living that was reasonable. Mm -hmm. And now looking back at it, we're thinking, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. that um, what was wrong with me? And worse than that is some of us will have had the occasion of being with somebody whose memory is different than ours. And their memory of everything we did is was then that we were wrong and is wrong now. And so they hold us to that badness or to that evil or to that level of sin, if you will. And if we're not careful, we do the same thing. So what I believe to be true is we are always doing the best we can, given what we know and what we believe. And what we really need to do is to inquire into our knowing and believing, as opposed to judging ourselves based on a model that was appropriate and fair then, but isn't now. If we're evolving and we're growing, we have to allow ourselves to have a past that was as flawed as it was, given what we knew and what we believed, and not judge ourselves for it, but learn from it. I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to learn from something I feel a lot of shame from. Mm. I don't I don't learn from it. I, I want to have a drink. Uh, mm. I want to run. I want to escape. I want to do something to get away from the shame. I'm not facing what was the situation or the circumstance that I was dealing with, that I'm dealing with, that, that I, I can change. We're looking outside our window because we have just, just that, gusts that I see. A 50 mile an hour wind, wind. yeah. yeah, yeah. By, so, I think it was a so if we're not here in five minutes, it's because the storm <laughs> took us over. No, but what's, what's important in this is look at the standards that you're using to judge yourself with and do they actually apply to the condition that you're applying them to? Can you inquire into your nature now and say, if I've grown and I've and I've, I've matured, can I learn from that experience? Can I celebrate my past as what what I did that was the best I could do, and what did I learn from that, and how can I apply that? If you can't do that, then you end up in, in a real dilemma, which is live your life as the best you can and don't make any mistakes. <laughs> and if you do make any mistakes, they'll be held against you forever, not by others, but by you. And eventually the weight of the of the burden of that will be so heavy that you will not be able to have a life. Some people are dying from the burdens that they've been carrying from a time that they were living that is no longer no longer fits. It's no longer theirs, what they do. You know, uh, what what he's saying is that some people will saying? punish themselves. Oh, yes. If they can't forgive themselves or they can't say, well, that was the time and those were the circumstances. It was a mistake. I wouldn't do it today, but but if you can't forgive yourself, you may punish yourself uh, by not allowing good things to come your way. I spent some time talking to somebody recently who was telling me that everything he's done in the last 20 years has been to make up for what he did the first 20 years. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, then there's no credit for what you've made. No, no, this is just penance. You know, your life should not be a lot of mistakes followed by penance. Your life should be a lot of mistakes that you learn from that you don't have to repeat and that you can help teach other people as well as yourself how to live a life that's more prosperous, more positive, and more useful. If we're going to beat ourselves up for our past, we're going to walk around in the present moment with a lot of bruises. And when other people see the bruises, they're going to deal with that. They like bruised people, uh, or they don't like bruised people, and they're going to treat you accordingly. And so we're actually manifesting more of the very thing that we wished we wouldn't have to deal with anymore. Right. So, um, you know, this loving others as ourself, it starts with self-love. People who really love themselves are better able to love others. Uh, they know they haven't been perfect and they don't expect others to be perfect. But um, it's often harder, especially people who are our role models, you know, like mm -hmm. our politicians, our leaders, 
our ministers, people in high moral positions as we see it. We, I, I've, I've, known, I've noticed in myself as I explore how I feel about this person or that, that if they're in a real leadership position or, or a ministerial position, I hold them to a higher standard. And I have a little, I, I they, they were wonderful, but, you know, there was this flaw. This thing they did. Yeah, and, and I've realized that I really need to get over that because all humans are imperfect, including me. And um, that's a surprise. <laughs> and, and so we need to get over that and not expect them. The whole story of creation with the Garden of Eden and uh, Adam and, and Eve succumbing to the temptation of, of uh, eating from the tree of knowledge. It's, it's basically saying uh, all human beings are, are going to make mistakes. Just expect that. Just expect that. But since we believe that God is in us, it can, and, and so do Christians, by the way, it's in the Bible. Um, uh, so that, well, if I've got God in me, then how can I accept anything less than perfection in myself? Well, the human part of you probably will not be perfect. <laughs> and even when you think you're being perfect at the time, later in hindsight, you may say, eh, that wasn't so good. Uh, but you need to just get over that and accept that you're perfectly imperfect as a human part of you. And so is everybody else. So we need to cut them some slack. Um, there is a book called Unapologetically You by Steve Maraboli. And he says, stop trying to fix yourself. You're not broken. You are perfectly imperfect and powerful beyond measure. So you see, we can be both at the same time. We are both human and divine. And so we can be perfectly imperfect in our human self and divine with the power that we're able to use through the power of our minds, which is what we believe, what we expect, uh, what we expect in our future to happen or in our now. And so we need to, to remember that. Um, and, you know, it's, that's also in the quote that I, that I gave in the opening prayer that we love our neighbor as ourself. Uh, and, and it's likened to loving God, it says. So there's really, those are the only two laws Jesus ever gave us. You know, mm -hmm. they're just mm -hmm. and, and incredibly hard to embody all the time. <laughs> Either loving ourselves, our neighbors, our God. We can get mad at God when things don't go our way, especially if we lose a loved one. I've seen more people get mad at God than they do this. They do this. I can't believe in a God that would cause my mother to be taken from me at that time and that age. You know, like like God's going to be punished because you won't believe in. Or like God it. will step in and actually, yeah, that's the one I want. Yeah, I want. I need her right now. Uh, yeah, right. And this is a. <laughs> It's a pretty, pretty awful notion. And there's another piece to this too, and that is when we, if we can love and forgive, if we can love ourselves and forgive our trespasses as those who've trespassed against us, if we can do that knowing that they were doing the best they could, then we can allow for something that I think often in relationships becomes the thing that ruins the relationship. And that is, I, I love you. I have so far done really well. You have done really, really well. And things are good. Now we've had a fight. It's over. We can't have, we can't have, you can't disagree. You can't have a, a breakdown because if you have a breakdown, rather than thinking that you can repair it, you hold it against yourself and you now have a breakup. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that I've worked with because I've been in mental health for a lot of years have this model of we have to behave perfectly. And if we don't behave perfectly, it's over. Well, that, that creates then a false self because you couldn't be your authentic self uh, and 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 be flawless of anger and frustration and and ill-tempered you know attitude that wouldn't work. But I, I'm saying this because I think we often walk so carefully, so as not to stir anything up that could cause us trouble in the future, that we don't enjoy the walk. We're not able to take this journey of life in a in a way that allows us to celebrate it. You know, if you were on the dance floor, and I'm not I'm not a dancer. And you stepped on their partner's toe, would you simply say, that's it, we're not dancing anymore, not ever. <laughs> you'd say, sorry, let's continue to dance. And you become a better dancer. The way you become a better dancer is you learn how not to make as many missteps. If you spend your time judging all of the missteps, you can't dance. 
And this life thing that we're doing through is a dance. Uh, and we can change our minds. <clears throat> we can change our minds about who we judge and how we judge ourselves. Uh, and it's very important to remember that we have the power to change our minds. When I first came into this teaching in the 1970s, it was uh, the, the the metaphysical teaching of our centers for spiritual living was opposed to psychology and psychological treatment because the the thinking was it was all Freudian and the Freudian idea is that we were powerless against the subconscious, that whatever the subconscious had in it, whatever booga booga stuff was that had control over you. And there was not much you could do to change it. <clears throat> you could sit on a couch and talk all, and you'd talk for an hour a day, five days a week and do Freudian uh, therapy that way, but it wasn't very effective and it was very long and very expensive. So our metaphysics says, no, not psychology, because we believe we can change our thinking and therefore change our life. And we'd practice it. We not only believe it, we practice doing it. Well, then along came this gentleman that you talked about, Dr. Albert Earl. Ellis, Dr. Albert Ellis, who is the, the founder, the starter of cognitive behavioral therapy, which guess what? Cognitive means you're thinking. Behavior means how you act. So you you the whole therapy is designed to help people <laughs> change what they believe about things and therefore what they think about things and therefore how they behave and, and those circumstances. So suddenly, oh, it was right in our... Um, right in our field in our and, wheelhouse in our wheelhouse that's what i was trying <laughs> yeah. to say and so now most therapy and psychotherapy when people go in for however many sessions is designed to help you identify what you believe and practice ways that you can can self-talk to change what you believe and therefore how you feel and how you act and then years later you end up with somebody like byron katie Oof, yeah. who who asked a couple of simple questions and I don't remember all of them but but the first one is is it true well first you identify your beliefs you yeah know, you and, is it, the belief. and, and is it see I knew there was something there yeah. I just wonder is it true is it true no <laughs> but it is the condition or the situation that you've assessed to be the situation is that really That's true causing you pain yeah, is that really true is it really true? Yes. And it's amazing. Can how, you be absolutely certain that? Oh true. my God! And, and the, you know, it, isn't it interesting that a hundred years into mental health and psychology and all of that, that this woman who has a practical death experience and wakes up and isn't even sure who she is, starts asking some simple questions that we're not asking, which is, is it true? Is it really true? Are you, are you absolutely sure it's true? And wow. and then the next question is, how this. do you feel when you believe that thought? Yeah, yeah. yeah really. <laughs> How do you feel when you believe that thought? Well, you know, usually not very good. Uh, and so the next, how would you feel if you believed the opposite thought? So it it really is it's elegant. A profound, it's, it's elegant. Profound, yeah, really uh, an elegant process. We we were in a Silomar uh, years ago, and and they, we invited our organization invited her to come in and do what she does. And she did it so beautifully and so elegantly. We just sat there by the hour thinking, this is amazing. Why can't we do, why can't we do more of this? So we have to ask ourselves, is this thing I believe about myself that has hurting me or putting me down or making me wrong? Is it really true? Is it really true? It may have been true for us and our experience in the past, but is it true now? If you're holding yourself hostage to a past crime, it's time to say I've served my time. And it's time now for you to serve time in a new way and to give yourself permission to be whole, perfect, and complete in the moment, having had the experience that you can learn and grow from. Right. Now, uh, this month, we've been talking about finding your passion. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about what did you love doing as a child? Because often your passion for that joy will lead somehow into your passion for in adulthood. And you can make that be your, your mission in your life. And it's important that you, you feel passionately about it. Last week, we talked about fine, uh, percolating. We didn't get it recorded, sorry. We didn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, but we were talking about percolating uh, purpose with your passion, which means how can I use my passion to help the planet or other people as well as myself? 
Yeah. Very important concept. Yeah. And so today, really, we're still talking about your passion <clears throat> for what you do in life uh, and your legacy for what you leave in life. Because if you're busy punishing yourself for not being perfect, you won't allow yourself to do great things and be a great person. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's really important to to love yourself as and love your neighbors. Don't hold them to impossible standards. They're not perfect either. And so as we love and accept ourselves, love and accept others, we can be more humanitarian and we can allow ourselves to be more successful with our passion and our purpose. So if we could be without judgment of ourselves and without judgment for others, but we could be able to assess the condition and learn from it, assess where we are in relationship to it, we would live a different life than if we live it in judgment. Years ago, I was living in the city <clears throat> and uh, there, was, there was a neighborhood that I was walking through that I didn't think much about. A person who was homeless and smelled bad and looked bad and was missing lots of teeth and just the kind of person that I typically would have judged very quickly as somebody I won't be talking to. He stepped out in front of me and he said, you don't want to go there. And I said, what do you mean? He said, there's a gang around the corner and and, and they're likely to, to to rob you. What I didn't do was to say, but you're you're a homeless person, aren't you? And you haven't had the benefits that I've had. And there's something wrong with you that you're homeless and I'm not, I'm going to ignore you. No, what I did was I said, thank you. And that man at that point, I didn't care what his history was. I didn't care what his past was. All I knew was that and he probably had saved my life, maybe my, and my wallet for sure. We need to be careful not to judge people and not to judge ourselves on the basis of appearances. And very often that's all we have is an appearance. We have the appearance of the things we did until we dig a little deeper. And uh, so anyway, that's my thought on that for today. And it's about time for us to wind up, but I I, I just want to share one personal yeah. one personal story. I've always um, been uncomfortable with telling a lie as a child, even, and and yet in my earlier life, I found it necessary for self protection. And lying is always a form of self protection, uh, but I so I found it necessary to lie, but it cost me because every time I would tell a lie to protect myself. Uh, I gave up a little of my integrity, my wholeness, my truth. But I, I had to do it, I thought, because it was it was a form of self-protection. Uh, when I got into relationship with Bob and I ended the, the relationship where I felt I had to lie, I told him, I will never, I will never tell another lie <laughs> because it costs me too much. Mm -hmm. It gives it. I have to give away too much of my integrity. And so it's not worth it to me. I will never tell a lie. Uh, so it may be painful, times, but I'm not telling any lies. So, and uh, so I forgive myself for that behavior because I know the motivation for it, but you can still, another way of forgiving yourself is to not do it anymore, you know, to be uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right. So. I love it. Let's, uh, let's close with a prayer, shall we? Yes, yes. Okay, so let's come together and know that truly we love ourselves and our humanness. We know we are not perfect. We are not even intended or expected to be perfect. And yet there is that part of us which is total perfection. It is the divine within us. It is all powerful. It is all loving. And as we are loved by it, we choose to love ourselves and love others. And we give thanks, we release, and together we say. And so it and is. And so it is. And now we're going to go to share screen here, and we're going to. Okay. I'm going to let you do that. Oh, okay. So in order for this ministry to continue, what's essential for us is that we have your support, both emotionally, spiritually, and financially. If you'd like to support our organization, and we, we really appreciate that you do, uh, we'd like you to go to our website, Find Science of Mind in Palm Beaches. Uh, on, you can see it on your screen right now. Yeah, right, and cslpalmbeaches.org. And when you go to that, you'll find different ways that you can donate. It will tell you how to, you can do that, ways to donate. And so please give give according to your ability. And uh, and, and if this doesn't, if our teaching doesn't 
help you or encourage you or empower you or uplift you, find one that does, find the things that do and support them because we need to support whatever gives us our good. So I'd like to end this, this segment with a saying together. My investment, My investment today, today is made with, with the, the full, full realization, realization that God, God is the source of my supply and returns it to me, enriched and multiplied. And I'm going to end the uh, stop. I'm actually, I'm going to end. Recording? Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it's not, I guess we have to stop sharing first. Okay. Stop sharing. Yeah. Okay, now we have to end the recording.